On today's episode, some hot news that really needed to be talked about. There was a team that needs to explain themselves to the rest of us. But speaking of explain yourself, that's what today's episode is all about. Some players who are much higher or much lower in our individual rankings, and we get put on the microphone solo, spotlight on us, and we got to explain ourselves. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Leave us a comment on some players that need some explaining, and enjoy. Hey, this is DeAndre Hopkins, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Tuesday, May 30th, 2023, Fantasy Footballers, we're back. We're very staccato today. Yeah. Brooks is back in the building, hey -o. which is good. Just being pretty lazy for a few <laughs> days, as the producers have been before. Oh, man. that's It's a good bit. You want to know what um, what's interesting is that the series finale of Succession, a show that I know for a fact. No spoilers. Judge Giamatti himself adores. Uh, came out, and uh, I know he hadn't watched any. He was going to binge the last season. And I think it's just a little coincidental. He missed some time here mm. and managed to get through how many episodes out of those 10 that you needed to watch? Somehow we got... Caught up just Somehow. in time for the se the finale last you night. You got caught up. Okay. Somehow I perfectly timed out a schedule. And you know. the truth <laughs> shall set you free. Uh, unfortunately, that will impact uh, the succession plans here at the company for you, Brooks. So mm. I'm sorry to hear that. He doesn't need it. It's filthy rich. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I don't watch, haven't watched. Not that I'm opposed to, just I haven't watched it yet. Uh, so the final one happened? Yes. A lot of success. Uh, <laughs> no spoilers. I'm, yeah, two, I'm I mean, two episodes away. <laughs> Jason is behind. Uh, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out if people succeeded. Some oh, success. There was some. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah some success. Mild yeah. success. Mild success. Uh, welcome into the show. We. I don't know what they're even succeeding at. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. Um, explain yourself on the show today. Taking a look at some of our uh, early rankings. And areas where one of us kind of uh, detours away from the other two and giving them an opportunity on today's show to explain themselves. Yeah, th I think this is always a, a really valuable show because um, a lot of times the arguments for the people explaining their strong and more unique position sway me. So I will see if you two can sway me today. Yeah, and then the big news, here we are on Tuesday and the next show we have will be June the day that the ultimate draft kit is launched. And so uh, lots lots of work has been building to this point. And June 1st, uh, on Thursday, the ultimate draft kit is here. You can learn more about that at ultimatedraftkit.com. This also means that today's the last time I'm going to get to tell you to pick it up at the pre-order price. Yeah, it, this is the, literally the last time we could say, hey, save money. If you're listening right now and you don't have the Ultimate Draft Kit yet, get it now. It launches like in a minute and you can get pre-order pricing right now. And if you're getting the UDK Plus, that is a pretty big savings. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we got in store for you this year. All the sleepers, breakouts, busts, and value picks are in there. Uh, we're wrapping up the 100-plus player profile videos, all of our rankings, upside meters, risk meters. Um, there is, there's a lot of content, and you're going to love it. We want to hear from you. So go, go on to Twitter. Um, if you've picked it up, once you start checking it out on Thursday at the FF Ballers, let us know. You can follow Jason at Jason FFL, Mike at FF Hitman. I'm at Andy Holloway. Let us know what you think. And uh, it's not, you know, one of the big things about the UDK is that, you know, unlike those uh, ancient magazines of old, this is an, a living, breathing, always changing, always updating product. So from now, which is, you know, we're sitting here May 30th, all the way through kickoff, we're going to be making tweaks and updates and changes 
and reacting to the news. There's a news feed inside of it, so you can keep up to date. And um, the statistics, we want you to win your league. Yeah, the statistics on Kyler Murray and Hollywood Brown have changed already because yeah, they have. it was not printed and shipped. And so the, the quick question for today ties directly into the UDK. Uh, Brooks threw in here, favorite feature or insight from the UDK, favorite upgrade. Is there something real quick? That you can touch on that you think is for especially me, impactful. Yeah, for me, I, I, I love the Red Zone Report. Just being able to go in and look at the really high value um, opportunities and see where inefficiencies were. We've capitalized that uh, on that in years past. So, for instance, Zeke had 19 carries inside the five. And r right now, Zeke is gone. The, there is a huge goal line opportunity uh, that is available there. Or, or Joe Mixon, who had 16 carries inside the five, only scored five touchdowns on those. His opportunities should be able to bounce back. Or, um, you know, another one that stood out to me, Jalen Hurts and Miles Sanders combined for 32 carries inside the five Sounds yard about line. right. I mean, you know, the, that that offense is is really awesome. So you could take a look at that. You could take a look at the wide receivers, the, the quarterbacks, and see the truly, really valuable fantasy – uh, opportunities, and you can go, oh, look, b based on this, this should have happened, but it didn't. I'm going to bet on what should happen versus just what happened last year. Yeah, I'll throw out the the newer feature, the upside meters that we added to the UDK because they coincide with like the risk ratings that we've had for years, and it allows you to quickly identify players that you know are in a position where, yes, maybe the risk is significant, but you also have a high upside later in your draft. Uh, players with opportunities – that are more consistent but lower upside and lets you balance your team in kind of an efficient way. I like to have, you know, we kind of say those last three picks in the draft. You know, one of them, a lot of the times you're going to be in a situation where you're going to want to be able to be active on the waiver wire immediately in the season. So, you know, you finish your draft, you've got a roster, but you probably are going to have some guys that you're tempted to drop. Make sure your last couple of picks give you upside, something that you can see early in the season so you can make a decision on them quickly um, as opposed to just kind of a maybe low risk but low reward player that you're just going to drop anyway. So um, that's kind of the feature I'd be focusing on. And I'll chime in here for uh, the best ball primer, which is it's in the UDK plus, but those who are out there, like we have many months still. Uh, and football is approaching, but it is best ball season. And this thing is an absolute beast that, that Borg and Betts put together every single year. It's got the team outlook, where to look for your stacks. You're talking about uh, their personal high ex highest exposures to players. Compare our ranks to the underdog ADP. So where you see where you can uh, extract value based on our projections and things like that. But it is how many words is that this year? This uh, Kyle, how many words this year? It's like fifteen to twenty thousand. Yeah. I mean, it's an absolute monster. And if you play best ball, you should be utilizing this as one of your go-to tools. Yeah, and if you can't read, do that first. And then learn, learn to learn read. To read yeah. and, oh, and okay. then pick this up. Um, UltimateDraftKit.com. Uh, those are just some of the highlights. Let's talk NFL news. News and notes from around the league. Hit the music. The Cardinals have released. Wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins. What they, pick? What pick did we get for him? Had to be a good one. I was I was going to look up the. Uh, they just let him go. Hold on, I'm going to look up the Devonte Adams trade. Let's see uh, where we got. Got to get this. So Devonte Adams became a uh, a Raider last year. I still can't find. Why is it so hard to find tr trade stuff from last year? <laughs> the Cardinals. Yeah, the Cardinals. Uh, their offseason continue. I mean, they they dumped DeAndre Hopkins. Not even a post June first cut. They just took it. What twenty two million? I mean, like, on the chin. The for Moving the team all. that was honestly, if you're going to get rid of DeAndre Hopkins, that's how you should do it. Just twenty twenty three with a quarterback coming off of an ACL injury, and it you're rebuilding for this year. Eat it. Eat that salary cap. Have nothing moving forward. Um, it, it's just it was shocking to me 
And uh, it was a uh, 2022 first round pick and a 2022 second round pick. Right. And then they gave him a gigantic extension for a player, the players who are basically the same age. I know that uh, that Hopkins has missed games, but it's like, how do you not get anything because of the contract? It's because the Raiders weren't available to trade with. <laughs> they had already gotten DeAndre sure. or uh, Devontae Adams. Uh, but the market is hot and heavy already for DeAndre Hopkins, which, I mean, shocking. Uh, the, the What we're hearing the most, it's the Chiefs, it's the Bills. It's going to be some great team, and they're going to get DeAndre Hopkins for just salary. I That's, you know, I go – on Twitter and I see people asking like he joins the chiefs. He joins the bills. What are the, what, what will Hopkins be in those situations? And then what will the fallout be? I mean, if he joins Kansas city, you know, the Kadarius Tony hype train can just get completely derailed mm -hmm. as it should just cancel the tickets. Just, just, yeah. I mean, board it up. And, and then in Buffalo, it's like, I'm not really going to move digs that far. But he's gonna move. Yeah, and it would it, it would absolutely one hundred percent crush Gabe Davis, who is oh yeah a very high volume like he he's in like ninety percent of snaps. He, you know he's in two wide receiver sets. Oh, it'd be so good for Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes and, though. Yeah, that's really the big key. You know, if he goes to Buffalo, it's not so much great for Hopkins, but Josh Allen with with two superstars. But I mean, you see a wide receiver too in it, either location or higher. Oh, for fantasy, is yeah, he Hopkins. like a top? He's definitely a top twenty-four wide receiver in either situation. I mean, people forget again. You look at the Cardinals, you hear the music. He was great when he played fo football last year with Kyler Murray, um, and so rumors coming out he didn't play when he was healthy last year as well. That was another thing that came out. I don't know if you saw that. I did not see but that. One. Multiple games, fully healthy, didn't take the field. That seems so, not great. Yeah, and so there is. Um, you know, for there only being the Chiefs and Bills interested right now. That's just oh, the leading. I'm yeah, sure, there's a lot of teams. I'm interested. sure uh, 31 of 32 teams are, right. are checking in on DeAndre Hopkins right now. Um, well, Mike, why don't you catch us up on this Jimmy Garoppolo news? So <laughs> the Jimmy Garoppolo news, uh, perhaps starting quarterback for the Las Vegas Raiders. It is now a perhaps because he had a foot surgery in March. And now everything is messed up. He's not participating in OTAs. There was a quote, hopefully he's ready for week one. And then it started to come out that the the Raiders have reworked his contract. Essentially, they took his signing bonus. That is now into base salary, which means he does not get that money right now. And the the, the TLDR is if Jimmy Garoppolo is not healthy sooner than later, the Raiders can just – cut him and move on yeah if you if you recall uh we we briefly mentioned it on the podcast yeah there was a like, pump fake like the, the announcement that the twitter sphere went crazy garoppolo to raiders yeah okay what's that's interesting but then the team kind of was silent about it and then a week later they came out they're like yeah we got jimmy garoppolo and it was like what what happened in that time period that you didn't announce that jimmy garoppolo was your starting quarterback well this is what happened he has a foot problem and there is no guarantee that he is the starting quarterback for the Raiders this and, year. And in, in totally unrelated news, Tom Brady um, is now an owner of the Raiders. Who <laughs> Minority are, order. He's like, right, 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 yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I'm just saying he is part of that organization. Also, Josh McDaniels is still the head coach. You know, the Patriots long time I can't, like, coordinator. So you, I'm just saying if I'm in a super flex You're gonna fan those flames? If, if I'm in a super flex <sighs> dynasty league. Those old I'm, flames? I'm looking on my waiver wire just to see if Thomas they Brady has been dropped. It, and then Brian Hoyer, he does nothing better than backing up Brady. No, that Brian Hoyer's on the roster and they have a rookie. I mean, if this goes south with Jimmy Garoppolo and they can cut him because it has to do with his foot. Are they, are they calling on Trey Lance? Are you calling on you? They I have mean, to do something. It 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 can't be Brian. Hoyer. Devontae be Brian Adams Hoyer. will not hang around. It it can't be Brian Hoyer. Hoyer's a fine backup quarterback, but you he's have thirty seven now. You have to have a plan. Oh Lord, is our slack <laughs> is Carson Wentz? You, oh, you need, oh, yes. Matt Ryan, baby. Yes. <laughs> you need to have a real grown up plan 
And a grown-up plan does not involve Carson Wentz oh, coming yes, and being does. the quarterback of your team. Oh, yes, Carson. But is I, Trey Lance, I mean, at, at this point, I – I don't even know. Like, like what what backup quarterback can they go trade just a, a bag of chips for that is worth a a shot to be a starter? If it's Matt Ryan, oh, it's it and your be. bet, your little Carson Wentz Matt Ryan bet goes sideways. It's gonna be Carson. Falcons tight end Kyle Pitts was not participating in OTAs last week. Had surgery for his MCL in November last year. Matthew Betts says he should be a hundred percent by training camp. So I believe him. Yep. Uh, and then ESPN had a report writing the Jaguars. Didn't want to see Travis Etienne taking 74% of the running back carries again. Um, Tank Bigsby was a third-round pick. We've talked about it on the show. Uh, I don't think I'd want my running back getting 74% either. I definitely don't blame him for that. And so that could speak to a, a more of a balancing there. I don't think that means Etienne's going to necessarily struggle. He's, he's been very efficient. But um, – it's an important report. Yeah. The plan last year wasn't for him to take 74%. The plan went sideways when James Robinson went stopped sideways. performing and then and then complained about it, and they shipped him off. Yeah. It, this is this is what the, the Jaguars, with their actions, have told us as well. And ETN is still a fine running back, too, with weekly running back one upside. But you just like when you're making your decisions here, if you're looking at ETN or someone who's you're like, oh, this is a talented running back who should see 70-plus percent of their team's attempts. Maybe you go that direction. Um, yeah, his his best ball ADP is uh, mm -hmm. well well ahead of where we have him ranked. Yeah, he's he's a running back one right now. He is the he's the running back 12 being drafted off the board. So you're, you've got to assume he's going to be very efficient or still have, you know, if not a 74%, you're going, oh, he's got a 68%. Right. You know, it's got to be close to that to return on the value. Obviously, he's a super talented player, but um, I think Tank, Tank Bigsby is also a talented running back worthy of a day two pick, and so do the Jaguars. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where his role is on the team, and especially when it comes to, like, is ETN out there on every third down? Pass protecting. I mean, I rookie know. rookies stepping in to do that are difficult. So is it, is Tank Bigsby just taking a drive here and there? I don't know. Um, we'll find out soon enough. We'll get to see him in training camp. Any other news, Brooksy? That's all for now. Okay, let's take a quick break. Come back with uh, explain yourself. It does seem like the Raiders are like on the razor's edge of being a disaster. Yes. Like in, in the maybe we commit for Caleb Williams type mm -hmm. of disaster. Like there's not options out there that are – like when Carson Wentz's name is brought up in a conversation, you've already reached the point where you might want to hit the panic button. I think that Carson Wentz might be a better path to the number one pick than Brian Hoyer. <laughs> oh, man. You and I think your both Carson can get him there. Hatred. I think both can get him there. It's only because he's bad at football. It's a strong point, Jason. What do you yeah, have? What, do you have, do a, you have counter? a counter to that? Uh, I have a counter that he wasn't he, always that he is okay. far better than Brian Hoyer at football right now. I don't know. <laughs> Who would you rather have run your offense, Colt McCoy or Carson Wentz? Carson Wentz. Colt McCoy. Which one has a job right now? <laughs> well, yeah, the better quarterback does. Um, is is Carson Wentz just a bad time? I think so. I like think that's in, in the, a locker room, though. I mean, like that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I think he's not the most beloved. Like, does fella. he turn the music way down? <laughs> Do you know what or, I mean? Or it's just like polka. He switches it. Yeah, he's he like. I don't a, know if he's a polka guy. You uh, think so? I don't know. I think he's. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. Smooth jazz kind of. I don't know. <laughs> All right, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. I don't think any of us are explaining our Carson Wentz rank today, thankfully. I'm quite well, thank you. No. Clearly you are not. No rational person would do as you have done. Explain yourself. All right, we're going to take a look at Six players that one of us in particular has ranked uh, quite a bit differently than the other two. And 
We'll start with a player for Mike, which, by the way, I see Kyle sharing the Raiders win total right now, seven and a half. I think I put an under bet on the Raiders about <laughs> six weeks ago. So this is only uh, adding to that. I don't think it's heading the right direction. I'm sorry, Raiders fans. All right, my, the first player we're going to look at, Mike has ranked at 15. Uh, I got him at 25, Jason at 29. We've actually talked about this guy a, a decent amount this offseason. Um, all of us have him ranked ahead of his underdog best ball ADP of 31 at his position. And I think we all like him. Mm -hmm. But Mike has a a much higher rank because, you know, your ranking is kind of where you think that they're going to end up. And, and this is right on the fringe of a, a wide receiver one. And we are talking about San Francisco 49ers wide receiver Brandon Ayuk, who had a very good year last year. That team is always dealing with injuries. I think the question in, in, in a lot of people's minds are full strength 49ers. What is the role for Brandon Ayuk, Mike? It's time for you to explain yourself. Yes, I have a Brandon Ayuk. I, I have him ranked pretty high. Uh, uh, I mean, compared to where he finished last year, I don't. He's actually very neutral because he finished as a wide receiver 15. From weeks 6 through 17, he was the wide receiver 6. Look, he It starts with Brandon Ayuk, number one, being just a, a good wide receiver. And think of the uh, the just the story of Brandon Ayuk. It's it's taken us a while to get here. First round pick, that's that's fantastic. The production profile wasn't what you would hope for for Brandon Ayuk, but then he got the draft capital. It was a little surprising. Comes in, has a, a rookie campaign where you go, I can see it. I can absolutely see the path for Brandon Ayuk to become a good wide receiver. Then Kyle Shanahan, something happened behind the scenes that we did not completely see. I think we heard, finally heard whispers. It was just was Ayuk wasn't taking practice as serious as the coaching staff wanted. But Brandon Ayuk got doghoused. Debo Samuel had a, a breakout campaign. But towards the end of the year, you're like, okay, maybe Brandon Ayuk has, has proven himself to this team. And then last year, you have a really big season for him. He's, he is a true deep threat. He's a good route runner. And the, we have this tweet here from from Jacob Gibbs, and he broke down the big three for San Francisco. Debo, Kittle, Brandon Ayuk. What does it look like when they're all on the field for 300 dropbacks? And it was the target share between Debo and Ayuk was within three percentage points, so not a huge disparity. But what was a huge disparity, the air yardage share was plus 13% for Brandon Ayuk versus Debo. And that, that ended up putting the receiving yard is pretty similar between the two of them. But I just, to me, one receiver is moving. Uh, these receivers are moving in kind of different directions with what their careers are. I think that Brandon Ayuk can take that step to become one of the better wide receivers in the NFL. And the fact that if we're going to have Brock Purdy be the quarterback who the three of us were projecting it's going to be Brock Purdy. There was a little news blurb that he's going to start throwing in a week or two. Uh, so that that was great news for Purdy. But if it's a pocket passer and it's not Trey Lance, we can have more confidence in these pass catchers, and, and that's how I, I see things shaking out. And Debo with his ups and downs, with his – no one's really you know injury prone, but I think Debo Samuel might be injury prone. His body just keeps uh, betraying him at all levels of football. And there's Brandon Ayuk just just coming through, being an excellent player for this team, and could tr easily turn in to their number one wide receiver. Yeah, I, if I, he's not already, I get what you're saying, and and he very well might be. I mean, he outscored Debo in points per game last season, so you can already say, oh, he he should be their wide receiver one. The only issue I have because I think he's a talented guy. I mean, I've loved him, uh, you know, for for years as as an actual player. The issue is and why I think Andy and I have him ranked lower, it's hard when you are splitting targets three ways, and it is very hard when it's four ways. And right now, you've got Debo, you've got Kittle, you've got Ayuk, and you have to include Christian McCaffrey, who sure. could lead everybody in targets. And so that just makes it to where very difficult. Like, when I do my projections, I'm projecting health for everybody. Now, that won't happen perfectly. So if you want to make the argument that, Look, Debo's going to miss half the year, and I'm going to bet on that. And if he did, Ayuk would be much, much better. 
But when I do my projections, everyone's playing, and if everybody's playing, there is just not enough passing volume to go around for me. Yeah, I, I get that. I mean, it's it's a it's one of the hardest offenses to really look at because, like, I don't think I think he's the fourth most talented of that group. Oh, I mean, I think Debo's a more talented. Get bought. <laughs> no, I mean he's, Debo's a more talented athlete and a player. Uh, Kittle, I think, is extremely talented and a game breaker at the position. McCaffrey, we already went on to sing those praises. So, there, I haven't seen a football game where Brandon Ayuka feel like is takes over. Yeah, he's not. He's not like uh, demanding the targets necessarily, but I mean the proof is in the pudding. Like he's very productive. Like he he's a super productive. You're gonna get uh, eight touchdowns. I think Debo scored twice through the air. I mean he he uh, scored four times as many touchdowns as Debo through the air. So, um couple multi-touchdown games for Ayuk. I mean, there were impressive games, no doubt, and he's going to have a lot of room to work because those other three guys are so much of a focus. Like, when the defense is playing the 49ers, they are not getting into that room and going, man, how do we stop Brandon Ayuk today? Like, that's not the beginning of their conversation. And so he gets room to work. He's got first-round draft capital. But um, I think this offense is going to be – it's going to be an interesting – season for them because Purdy's going to, when he gets back is, is freshly back from injury, Trey Lance lurking and a defense that's as good as anything in football. So, um, yeah, Mike, Mike with the confidence in Brandon Ayuk, And I, I think it's fair. It's hard to argue when he's finished at that position. Well, and he's he, he, despite the, the first half of 2021 being just a complete dumpster fire of, of absolute nothingness. We're going into year four. He's improved on uh on on yardage and he didn't improve on touchdowns freshman to sophomore but five five to eight seven forty eight yards eight hundred twenty six yards up over a thousand this past year I mean that's the the ascension is clear to me of of who's becoming the the go to guy for them shall we move on shall we well uh, Jason it's your turn to explain yourself you have uh, decided. In whatever Staten Island uh, <laughs> desk you were sitting at, mm -hmm. that you would besmirch a sophomore running back mm -hmm. that had uh, an incredible rookie season. Mm -hmm. Who, when you watched play football, I was entertained. Mike, were you entertained? Uh, I was very entertained. I, as we were both entertained. Yeah. I thought he looked great. Yeah, I mean, he looked fierce. He was fierce because he's Damian Pierce. Mike and I, we got him. Right inside our top 24. Mike at 24, I'm at 22. I consider ourselves reasonable people. You got him at 32, um, which is uh, – that's down there. That's it's, down there. It's so a, making sure you know. 32 teams. There's 32 teams. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, okay, uh, you, but you know that. I am currently aware. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and so, Jason – You uh, may not be later. Without further ado, explain yourself. Yeah, so apparently I hate Damian Pierce, um, who, when I watched last year, I thought, excellent running back, looks good, young running back, that's always great, and I don't want any part of him in fantasy uh, where, you know, where he's going is going to be ahead of where I would be willing to draft him, and I have two main reasons for this. One is the historical uh, context and data on draft capital. And, and you mix that with a new coaching staff that was not here for that rookie breakout last year. Damian Pierce is a day three pick. And for better or worse, the difference between a day two pick and a day three pick in the NFL is massive. It's very meaningful for about a, a franchise. Day. About a day. About a day, but it's like... It, 24 hours. The, the, the second round and third round picks, those are perceived as so valuable. So much work is put into them. And then... Day three is like, okay, we're going to shotgun, you know, fourth through seventh, get special teamers and, and whatnot. And, but here's the proof, right? I went back and over the last decade, I looked at all of the best fourth round running backs over the last decade. So I'm not talking about, like, obviously people picked in the fourth should be worse than people picked in the first. I'm talking about the ones who performed well, the best of the best over the last decade who proved they were good. The next year, their sophomore year, on average, those players lost. 42 fantasy points per per season on average. And in fact, almost all of them were worse. Only two of the top 10 were better in year two, Tariq Cohen and Ramondre Stevenson. And if you compare that to the guys picked in round three, just barely ahead, 
on average, they score 20 more fantasy points per game, and 50% of them improve on their rookie numbers. But day three picks just don't have the same – the team is not invested the same way. And so that's another issue. They went out this offseason with this coaching staff and picked up Devin Singletary. Devin Singletary is making $3 million. Damian Pierce was the day three pick making a million dollars. And Dave, Devin Singletary does not get enough respect, in my opinion, as a running back. He is a good veteran running back who just played meaningful snaps for a Super Bowl contender who took a second round pick in James Cook and said, no, you're the backup. I got 177 carries. You get 89 carries. You combine all of this and you look at what I mean. We, we were talking in in the uh, profile video today for Damian Pierce that'll be in the UDK about the percentage of running back carries that went to Damian Pierce. I mean, yeah, he had a great season, but part of the reason he had a great season was because his prime, the next most carries went to Daria Gumbawale. Like, there was nobody else to hand ten, the ball to. Ten of the 13 games he played, I believe he was at 85 percent or higher yeah that's just he had never six, six or seven games at 100 percent. so that's that was like that's what remember james robinson's rookie year that 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 was what happened that's like, what we talked about in the office because the, the the percent of the market share of your of your running back attempts if you have just a monopoly on them at 85 percent like good things happen for your fantasy yeah. production and so that's just not in any way shape or form going to happen this doesn't project to be a great team they have a rookie quarterback who will probably start week one if you look back at the last decade of how their running backs performed only one was a top 24 running back so I, I'm completely out on Damian Pierce I worry he could be the next Jeremy Langford and you might not even remember Jeremy Langford but well, he I was that name he was a fourth round pick who had a great rookie Down campaign Bears. great rookie campaign everybody loved him I feel like we had this conversation about Jeremy, Jeremy Langford oh time. yeah we I'm sure we did because that was uh Jordan Howard right yep yeah. who yeah so, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, it's just, he's a, he's a fourth round running back. He's not getting better this year. He's getting worse. Yeah. I mean, his, it's pretty fair from your assessment that efficiency would have to increase. Touchdowns would have to increase. If he wants to equalize what he did last year, look, if he, if he gets a fewer, a smaller percentage of the running back carries, where he scores eight times. Sure. You're going to have the same finish. He definitely looked talented. But, oh, I mean, he's he's a very tough runner. He is a tackle breaker. For some reason, Kyle doesn't like him. I don't. <laughs> I, I think it's just kind of blindness. It's, that, that's because the, the, the hype machine guy. He didn't like him even going into the season. Did you like the 1,200-yard pace he had, Kyle? He didn't get to 1,200, did he? <laughs> did you like the pace? <laughs> he got steamed up way too much last year. You don't think he paid out on the steam? I don't know. I, Kyle? I don't think. I didn't draft him. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, no. Man. no. Kyle, Kyle holds grudges. <laughs> he really does. Um, and, and his entire argument is everyone likes him. Oh, this is true. Yeah. We have been digging into this. Kyle <laughs> hates the majority. That was, that was it. The contrarian <laughs> in him. Too many people Wait, find him attractive. So if we all turn against him, is there any chance you'll go? Oh, all in. <laughs> The chips will go all in. Not at RB twenty. That's too. That's too. That's rich, where right? you going right now. Yeah, yeah. An underdog. that's a little too. Yeah, that's, that's a little tough. too rich for me too. Um, especially with a. There's a possibility that Devin Singletary splits the carries with him. There's a strong possibility. So, um, all right, Andy, you're going to be up next yep. here, and we're talking about a player who I think we all like. We nobody's going to argue against the talent here, but you like him a whole heck of a lot. Uh, you like him more than Mike and I. Mike and I have him at 18 and 23. You have this player at number 10. And this team just went and drafted an additional target taker on the field away from him. And we're talking about the biggest, baddest man, DK Metcalf. Let's Explain try. yourself! Oh, there it is. There it is. You jumped it too soon. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm a little surprised that I am somehow on – Metcalf Island here. Um, this one, see, and, and Kyle, you said it was hot that I had him at 10. Where's his ADP right now? Do you have that? Wide receiver 15. Okay. Yeah, 10's hot. Okay, 10 is a little hot. Look, this is one where, you know, we've talked a little bit about this offense. We've seen the impact on the ADP of Tyler Lockett with the drafting of Jackson, Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, we saw Metcalf stay the same, and I think that that is appropriate. There are a handful 
of true alphas at the NFL level in terms of physicality, size, speed. Metcalf can win down the field. Metcalf can win in uh, up close. He's the best friend of quarterbacks. He's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. He's faster than you. Um, and I don't think you guys are debating that with your ranking at, nope. at, at all. Um, what I think happened last year is you saw just a very, very anomalous touchdown total from a guy that is maybe more other than a couple of players in the NFL, probably the most built like Des Bryant to end up in the end zone double or Mike Evans to end up with double digit touchdowns every single year. He did it in year two. He did it in year three. And then last year here is here he is with six touchdowns. Despite the fact that he literally led the NFL in end zone targets. He had 21 of them. So that ended up being kind of a letdown year. He ended up at 18 uh, being drafted at 15. But I think, I think Metcalf doesn't get impacted by Jackson Smith and Jigba. I think this is a player that um, 141 targets, 90 for 1048. You give him 10 touchdowns, we're not talking about him being a letdown in any way, shape, and form, and he should have had 10 touchdowns. Yeah, he should have. We're, we're talking about him being almost as good as Tyler Lockett. Hey. 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 Hey, hey comrades. <laughs> um, but we, we Kyle, Kyle helped me do some research here, and this was very, very interesting because he looked at the last decade of wide receivers. And there were 12 of them that averaged eight targets per game in their fourth year. Okay. That's what Metcalf did last year. He averaged eight targets a game. If you watch those games, he was the centerpiece, even though Lockett was the touchdown king. And so he looked at these 12 wide receivers that averaged eight targets a game in year four and see, and then averaged eight targets a game in year five, which is this year. And the list is kind of staggering in terms of how often those players end up being top eight the next season. So if DK Metcalf maintains eight targets a game, he's a true alpha. He's going to end up in that category. And you can look at this list from 2013 on, and other than Jarvis Landry, who in Miami, remember that one year in Miami? Oh, where, my gosh. Did he score 10 times that year? Nine times, 10 times? He had a kind of he a crazy caught, year. He caught 230 passes. That's how it felt. And so other than Landry, every single other player on that entire list, when they maintained eight targets, they ended up as a top eight wide receiver. So I think the ceiling is statistically built into the to the outcomes for him. I'm just kind of placing him closer to the ceiling than you guys are, which, you know, I, I understand hesitancy there. You probably like some other wide receivers a little bit more. But I think Metcalf is is a very high upside player at his at his ADP. And I think you're getting a true number one for your fantasy team when you take him. If you went running back early, you end up with DK Metcalf. I think you should be very, very happy, and you're going to get output that you're happy with. Yeah, I don't have any problem calling your shot on DK Metcalf. Two years ago, he was the wide receiver 12. Three years ago, he was the wide receiver 7. We already know he's got the ability to be a top 12 uh, wide receiver. Obviously, those were with Russell Wilson, but Geno Smith looked fully capable of supporting um, you know, a, a wide receiver 1. It's just got to flip between Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. The, uh, the, the issue when it when push comes to shove when drafting and you're looking at this team is that I think it is at least a it's not maybe a coin flip as to who finishes higher between Lockett and Metcalf you know let's call it 66 percent chance it's going to be Metcalf and 33 percent chance it's going to be sure, sure. Lockett but the gap in where you draft those players is not in any way reflecting that. So obviously you don't have to draft him at 10 and you're putting him down at 10 for that upside, which, which I like, I can fully appreciate it. Um, and I, and I don't think that I mean, you Debo are crazy is going, to think that. I think Debo is going ahead of him. That's, oh man. Debo right. is another player. Debo's I, one spot ahead of him. No, Debo is wide receiver 17. Oh, okay. oh so, okay. so just behind him. Not according to our ADP page, Kyle. <laughs> Well, our ADP is is a sleeper, not underdog. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, not. I wasn't looking at best ball. I was looking at current redraft. But but if that's the, the if those are the players that we're talking about, that's where I think he's he's a steal. But um, fair enough, Mike. No thoughts on him. Well, it's it's I, I'm you know I'm over here. I'm trying to make my Tyler Lockett jokes. Um. Because Tyler Lockett's been better in three of the four seasons that DK Metcalf has has been in the league, and then you look and it's Metcalf 2020. He was the he was wide receiver seven with Russ Wilson. Then he went 
to 12, then he went to 18. And it's like, I just, I think DK Metcalf is that guy. I mean, they gave him the contract, but I'm saying that guy for, for fantasy football. But I think that there, like, there are some doubts that are starting to, to, uh, sneak in, uh, just like creep under the gate here of is DK Metcalf really going to become that guy that we think the, the, the stats of the year four into year five, that's very interesting. I, I'm excited to see if that pays off here for DK Metcalf, DK Metcalf. Cause I feel like if you get another, <coughs> <laughs> another season, is that DK Metcalf? That yeah, was DK Metcalf. Okay. I got that's you. It. Like if you get another Some season Robert where, where Metcalf is like, wide receiver 15 or later like you're gonna close the book on you're that, gonna go um, is like will we ever actually see that ceiling yeah that that top three type dominant uh potential i i agree there um all right mike you're gonna be up here yeah, okay. this next player and this is a player that i thought i really liked but apparently i don't mike does i've got him at wide receiver 30 think he's a good wide receiver, but I got him at 30. Yeah, I mean, that's not – you don't really like a guy at 30, Jason. <laughs> it, it, well, I 30's like, not really liking a guy. I like him for his talent, but not for his team, not for his situation, not for his quarterbacks. I've got him at 28. I love him. Yeah, 28, 30, that feels about right. Mike up here at 14 yep. on Godwin. That means Chris you have him ahead Godwin. of DK Metcalf. So, Mike – Considerably. At 14. And foolishly. On Chris Godwin, it is time. For you to spline yourself. So it is. It this is, is so much spice. It is the Rod God. It is Christopher Godwin, who is 27. Look, it starts here with this is the second year recovering from the ACL. Last year was wild that he tore his ACL towards the end of the season two years ago. The fact that he was ready to go at the beginning of the season was pretty shocking. It was it was pretty bumpy along the way, but it wasn't just Chris Godwin. Like Tom Brady. That was not a good version that we saw last year of Tom Brady that did not stop Chris Godwin from from racking up a bunch of counting statistics. In 15 games, he put up the sixth most receptions of wide receivers last year, targeted on 23% of his routes, so he still has it. But there was a massive touchdown problem uh, for Chris Godwin last year who, who had, what, I believe uh, three, three, yeah. three touchdowns. So... Nothing Baker can't fix. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. I'll let you defend yourself. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, and also, you apologize, because nothing Kyle Trask can't fix is what you meant to say. There we go. It was uh, the worst touchdown percentage of Tom Brady's career. I think Tom Brady was just toast. So that's why I was laughing at your Tom Brady to Vegas. That would uh, that could be something special. But last year, so that, turned, that, that made Chris Godwin one of three wide receivers ever to have 100-plus receptions, 1,000 yards, and fewer than four touchdowns. Funny enough, one of them was Mr. Wes Welker uh, with, with, uh, Brady. with Thomas Brady. Was well, 2008, was that the ACL year? I don't uh, remember if Brady played that year. It's been too long. Uh, but the point is regression, or I should say, as we say on this show, positive regression should come for Christopher Godwin if he's still going to get that amount of receptions, that, that amount of yards. Over the last five years, wide receivers average a touchdown on about every 13 receptions. And that puts him closer to eight than instead of the three. I think I think that Chris Godwin still has it. He will be even healthier. Uh, it's funny, you know, we're the DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. There are massive parallels to those two play, uh, to to Godwin and Evans than to the Seattle wide receivers who last year we just buried in ADP because uh, Geno Smith was going to be the quarterback for that team. That's your best point. I it's just like. That's your oh, best point. You. That's your best point because we did, and people did. Yeah, it was oh, I'm like, guilty as charged. And, and, and I think we, we did have a couple of those times when we were just like, is this the dumbest thing ever? We've seen them play football. They're great. Yeah, and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, I think, are still good wide receivers. If if you want to say that Mike Evans is probably losing a step or two, okay, he's a bit older. But Chris Godwin at 27 in the prime of his wide receiver career or his wide receiver years – I think that people are massively undervaluing a, gra a great route runner, a player with good hands, and someone who, like, they're look at the, the weapons on this team. I mean, Chris Godwin should should see 
easily 24% of the targets. Here, here's the uh, – Jason, I'll let you speak too, but the worry here should would not be the case for the Metcalf Lockett under, under rating of last year. It's it's um, welcome to Deontay Johnson's life. That would sure. be that would be the bad case here because you lose the confidence of the B- Big Ben and, and Tom Brady. Like it bothers me a little that Chris Godwin can have 104 receptions in a season and finish at 20. Like that's I mean yards per catch going down four straight years. Um, you know production going down four straight years touchdown wise. The Deontay Johnson's the the bad case. The good case would be the the, the Metcalf Lockett kind of situation, but that is that's like, are you Kenny Pickett Baker, or are you closer to Geno Smith Baker? And I believe with the offensive line for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, we've seen Baker be good, we've seen Baker be bad, but I've never seen Baker be good under pressure. I mean, if if Baker's got guys coming at him, Baker turns into the worst quarterback imaginable, and he's going to have guys in his face. So that that's really the difficult thing and then you you look uh, a wise man once said earlier this morning that Tom Brady threw for 733 passing uh, yes. passes there were only 11 quarterbacks who threw for over 500 last year so if this team goes from 733 to 550 which seems very reasonable that's just so you know you can't worry about well positive touchdown regression you're going to lose so many targets just because the pie shrinks, even if your target market share is good. I like Chris Godwin, and what my my favorite part about it is the being year two from that injury because that was a severe. It wasn't a clean ACL. He shouldn't have been there for week one. I think Tom Brady just m- made him will it to happen. Stitched it together with uh, with broccoli. Yeah, and so I'm excited to see a healthy, talented Chris Godwin this year. But the the team situation around him scares me for I think there's thinking a, he could be top 15. There's I, a chance both guys are losing a step. There's a very good chance both guys are. Because, I mean, God, there's not a guarantee Godwin gets back to any of the form he had before. And, sure. And so it, it is probably like it could be both of them. It could be a new era for Tampa with the number one pick. And all of a sudden we're talking about like, you know, Marvin Harrison arriving in Tampa next year. Jason. I don't know what the hell you're doing with this Ooh, with this selection here. Yeah. I'm surprised that you decided that you wanted to speak on behalf of this player because I thought he was already on your Mount Rushmore of all timers. <laughs> but Terry McLaurin, mm. Terry McLaurin, we Jason's don't, champion. Don't don't read the rankings. Um, read them, read them, and weep. I mean, it makes. <laughs> I don't get it. Jason has him at 14, which I think is a reduction from where he had him. Mike has him at 25. I got him at 23. That feels generous to me. Um, you know why I don't like Chris Godwin? Because Baker Mayfield's his quarterback. Now, let me tell you about why I love Terry McLaurin with Sam Howell. Uh, Jason is alone when it comes to the the underdog universe, the best ball universe, who has him at 26. Um He's 27 years old, got three years left on a deal. Last year had 1,100 yards and five touchdowns. Jason Moore. You guys are crazy. It's time. Explain yourself. Do it. Okay. Terry McCla- Where's the? You don't have a jersey on for Terry McLaurin today? Uh, I got a tattoo, but <laughs> okay. I don't want to take the shirt off right now. It's yeah. it's fresh. It's, uh, ah, yeah. Got to gotta wait for that to heal up. Um. You haven't had it on in previous years. It is no. I look. Ter, we will, we would all agree. Terry McLaurin, very good wide receiver. Um, situation maybe not that great. I mean, this is a team who last year ran the ball the fourth most times, and they were twentieth in passing attempts. That's not great. And in that team with bad quarterback play, you want to know where Terry McLaurin finished? If you didn't remember, wide receiver fourteen. So I don't think it's that crazy that I got him at wide receiver fourteen at all. In fact, I think maybe I am too low. And I really think that because I had to move him down to wide receiver 14 when I actually finished my oh, initial man. rankings. And a lot of this is because of Eric Bieniemy and Scott Turner. Scott Turner, their former offensive coordinator, who was uh, apparently best friends with Curtis Samuel. He came from Carolina, played with Curtis Samuel and all of that jazz. He's out. He's gone. Who'd they bring in? Eric Bieniemy. Eric Bieniemy, obviously, we don't we don't know how great he is. He's he's had Patrick Mahomes, so like all of his numbers are going to look good. You can't look at well, how was his yardage and touchdown numbers? Uh, pretty good. He had he had Patrick Mahomes, 
But you can look at the passing attempts and the rushing attempts. What did he want to do in a perfect world? And he lived in a perfect world because he had Patrick Mahomes. And if you look at those numbers, you find someone with rushing offensive attempts. And this was for a team that was winning and running the clock out at the end of the games at 23rd in the league, 27th, 23rd, 20th, 25th. And passing attempt numbers for their offense, 5th in the league, 2nd in the league, 3rd in the league, ninth in the league. Now, obviously, we got to be realistic and say, well, Patrick Mahomes sways some of that. You're going to pass a lot more with Patrick Mahomes. But this is not going to be a team running the ball the fourth most in the league. And their strength now with Jahan Dotson is Jahan Dotson, Terry McLaurin are a great one-two punch. If you look from week 10 on, that's when Dotson got back from injury and they stopped doing all the weird gadget stuff with uh, Curtis Samuel. You had a great stretch for Terry McLaurin. He had a 27% market share. And I think him and Jahan Dotson, I'm in on both of them. And the thing is, is like, I actually do like Sam Howell. I think that, you know, I had him, so as, does a, Washington, I I had him as a first round uh, grade. Uh, he obviously was not drafted in the first round. He could come out and absolutely suck. Or the second. Yeah, no, yeah, he could or, come out or the third. and absolutely suck. Hold on, or the fourth. <laughs> Fifth, we did it. There we go. We, we found him. But if he sucks, that's fine. Because Jacoby Brissett is behind him, and what did he do with Amari Cooper last year? Like the, the quarterback situation is not great, but it's not worse than it was last year. So to me, was what, that a period at the end of that <laughs> sentence? I'm sorry, I didn't know if you were concluding your offensive. I believe that Terry McLaurin is a great NFL wide receiver. I think his situation is going to be much better with a healthy Jahan Dotson and Eric Bieniemy as offensive coordinator, and the quarterback situation is regardless of if it's better, it's not worse than last year. So we know he's already capable of being the wide receiver 14. Yeah, I, I think um, part of it is kind of getting back to the Metcalf Lockett situation. It's like I think Jahan Dotson has a decent chance to be the better fantasy wide receiver this year than Terry McLaurin. I think that's a possibility. And it's actually kind of interesting when you look at once he returned and was playing over 70% of the snaps, because he was coming off an injury that was mm -hmm. limiting him, limiting him, speaking of Dotson, when he first returned. But once he started playing over 70% of the snaps, it's ridiculous if you look at the splits in that time between Dotson and McLaurin. The final five games of the year where they were both doing that, McLaurin, 1,193-yard pace, Dotson, 1,169. McLaurin, 10.2 touchdown pace, Dotson. 10.2 touchdown pace, 119 targets, 115 targets, 71 receptions, 74 receptions. So that would be my only like kind of like why go all in on TMC if I can get Dotson later. That oh, might be the decision that I'd be making. Um, but, you know, that would be my only I've got, commentary. I've got no problem grabbing Dotson later and wanting a piece of the offense that way. I've, I've got both of them very highly ranked. One of the things that I – Dotson – Dotson, we've got Dotson here. One of the things I like about this offense is I think there's going to be a consolidation of targets. I, uh, you know, I believe Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson are going to be basically 50% of the targets. It's it's going to be those two guys, and we we've Why seen. Why are you it. dumping on Curtis Samuel so much? Just because obviously Ron Rivera is is very familiar with Curtis Samuel and has a loyalty to him too. I, I think Kurt. I mean, you know, I've been a Curtis Samuel guy over the uh, over the past. But if you look at what happened last year with their game log, when they were using Curtis Samuel a lot, they started. You know, he he was very involved those first five weeks. I believe they went one and four um, those first five weeks. It wasn't winning. And Jahan Dotson is great. So to me, it's not that I hate Curtis Samuel. It's that Jahan Dotson is just so much better that they're going to go out there. Eric Bieniemy is going to see these guys and go, here's my two special players. Let's design an offense around these two special players. Logan Thomas is offended. <laughs> I am not offended <laughs> by my statements. The fact no. that Logan Thomas even played football last year is... He really wasn't that bad either. I Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. So, Terry McLaurin, 14. Watch out for Logan. 14 going on two. Not bad. You can get him there. Uh, also, I think Logan Thomas was pretty bad last year. Was he? Uh, yeah. I think he had... Wait, you think or you looked it up? Uh, let me see. One touchdown, 323 yards. That's fair. In 14 games. That's fair. Yeah. I'm thinking of the year before. Well, the, yeah, the thing, considering the, the injury that he was coming off of, and we thought maybe he doesn't play football again. Yeah, he was a, he was a tight end six, but that was back in 2020. Yeah. It's been a minute. 
All right, the final player we're going to talk about, it is a running back. It's a running back who has been near and dear to my heart, has finished as the RB4 and the RB14. He may be one of the only true bell cows left, but we'll see if he gets used like that. Yeah, Jason and I have him ranked as a running back one. Andy more of like a middling running back two. It is Mr. Najee Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Andy, explain yourself. I just don't get excited about Najee Harris. I really don't. And I, don't I, I'm not I, – I, I don't you like said to middling that. running back two. I've got him near the top of the running back two. 16 is – 16 is not bad. 16 is fine. Too low. Well, now, now you're trying to just to, to say that your rank is good. I, well, I'm just taking issue with you saying middling. That's all. It's near the top. but he And it's different than you guys have him at 10 and 11. Look, he's just not that good of a player. He really isn't. How dare you? He's not that good of a running back. Yes, he is. He is Cedric Benson. That's what Najee mm. Harris is. You go look at their, their best years, mm. they're the same. He, you can't tell me a guy that's averaged 3.8 and 3.9 a carry is an amazing running back. Volume has been the key for Najee Harris. That's fine. But I have this team, the Steelers projected bottom 10, total plays, total yards, don't love the offense. Guess what? My stat projections, very similar to last year's stat projections for Najee Harris, where he finished at 14. I've got him at 16. That's fine. I don't see the upside of Najee Harris. I really don't. Jalen Warren's a player they want to get more involved. Kenny Pickett doesn't get me up in the morning. And, um, you know, when I'm looking at the players I'm deciding between, Miles Sanders. I see tons of upside in Carolina. You know, Travis Etienne I like more. Ramondre, Aaron Jones. Like, there are players that catch the football at – like, Najee used to do it. it to a degree that made him a special weapon, right? I didn't care about his efficiency on the ground when he was – uh, two years ago, what was it? Seventy-four receptions. I yeah, care. He was the I, running back four, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Two years ago. Well, last year when he recovered from his injury, uh, the second half of the year, he was the running back five during the. See, that, the final I don't. Eight I don't games. like the injury washing of the whole year because, as a rookie, he 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 was three point nine a carry, and as a sophomore, he was three point eight a carry. So, it's like, I feel like that's the easy way to go when a guy didn't play well. You watched him play. I watched him play. I watched the offensive line let everyone through like they were matadors and Najee trying to break tackles the second he grabs the ball. I also watched the Steelers this offseason spend big money on a couple of contracts and then spend their first round pick on an offensive lineman. And it's then, crazy because Jalen Warren averaged 4.6 behind the same line. So he must have put some different linemen out there for Jalen Warren. I am pro Jalen Warren. That's, Jaylen a, that's, a big, Warren, that, that's obvious that Jaylen the line Warren was to blame. was on the field during that stretch of games playing the snaps that you worry about when Najee was the running no, back I, five or the second half. Yeah, and that, and he averaged almost a yard better. So I'm just saying I, Najee Harris has shown me through two years he's a volume play. That's fine. Nothing wrong with the volume play. He's just not my volume play. Look, it's, it's like cafeteria food. They give you more because it doesn't taste as good. I want a fine meal oh. at, at this pick. If I'm going to have to spend a second-round draft pick on a running back, I want the chance that I'm having the best meal of my you life. Don't I don't want to have a – Doesn't want a meddling running back too, Jason. Hmm. Well, now it's meddling. <laughs> meddling doesn't even make sense. That would be like messing with my lineup, which he also does. <laughs> meddling, middling, bet, All middler, right. who cares? All right. <laughs> Um, well, good, good for everybody out there. The, uh, <laughs> did you say bet middling, bet midler, <laughs> bet middlering. Yeah. If he's bet middlering, I'm back in. All right. Tiered ranking stat projections all in the UDK, he which comes out on hero, Thursday. Then. Yes, he would. Fly. Oh man. Fly. We we all had parents that bet Fly. middler. Oh yeah. My mom loved bet oh, middler. Oh man. Yeah. The cassette tapes. No, um, I wonder how many people sitting here are like, who's bet midler? <laughs> <laughs> have we reached that point yeah i think at this I point the only have. thing she's famous from is hocus pocus yeah she yes yeah uh kids bet midler actress is, is the the main character in hocus pocus one and two um big bet midler fan brooksy nope <laughs> how about you al no nah no oh, yeah did your mom have the cassette tape though oh yeah yeah that yeah, was I mean, that, that was, was wind beneath my wings right yeah. 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 yeah yeah heard that a lot as a child all right the udk comes out thursday ultimate draftkit.com this is your last chance to get it at a discount you, uh, i know you're gonna get it i was on twitter and someone was talking about the udk and then somebody replied and said oh, i'm gonna get that soon 
Hey, look, um, look. I, well, yeah, because hey, it comes take out your June time. 1st. Take your time. <laughs> June 1st, get it. It's out. That's true. Take, you know what I mean? Like, you don't have to rush and save money right now. But, I mean, it's all com- Just take your time. I would get it on the first. But if you're like, eh, I do want to save money, <laughs> you're running out of time. All right. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back with another episode on Thursday for Bette Midler. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.